this is my power pose. So um, this helps me relax. And uh, hopefully give you a good presentation today. This is what I do before my talks. Okay, it's 4.20. Well, let's get started. Thanks everyone for being here. And uh, my name is Ray. I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. And this is my very first time in Minsk, in Belarus. So very, very happy to be here. And thanks for having me here as well. And part of my job is to bring some of the latest and greatest Google Cloud technology and open source technology to developers all over the world. So, um, so today I'm going to show you something uh, pretty cool. Uh, but the other side of my job is to make our services and our uh, open source projects better. So uh, if you have any feedback, please, please contact me on Twitter at Satanism. And uh, I also work on this other project called uh, Spring Cloud GCP. So if you're using Spring, Spring Boot, uh, check it out because it's one of the easiest way to use Google Cloud um, if you like to try it out. I uh, usually do this talk with Baruch. How many people here know or heard about Baruch? Yeah, everybody. <laughs> but too bad that he's not able to join me in this talk today. I really, really wish that he's here because he makes everything more fun. But uh, just so you know, I usually do this talk with him and uh, uh, a lot of the, the content here uh, we develop together. Okay? So today I'm going to show you a little bit about microservices. I'm not going to tell you uh, when to use it or something like that because that's a, that's a lot of theories. Uh, you have to make the decision yourself. Microservices architecture itself may actually be more complicated and it will be harder to implement and harder to debug and troubleshoot and all that. But I'm just going to show you some of the tools and uh, tips and tricks in case something happens and what you can do. And to show you um, the microservices deployment, here I have a, a really simple application. This is probably the best looking application I can ever write. It's just black and white, it's bootstrap and jQuery. And uh, but that's because I'm not a front end developer. Okay? But it's also very, very simple, very straightforward. It's got uh, a few best of the examples in a Hello World and getting started kind of thing. So there's a Hello World service and there's a guestbook service. It's also two of them. The, the simplest services I can actually put together. And behind the scenes, we're running these in containers, we're running these in uh, Kubernetes in an uh, orchestrated uh, fashion. So we have actually three application containers. We have the front end, we have the Hello World service, we have guestbook service, you know, all, all of these things just for you know, a simple page. Uh, and then we have Redis and MySQL. But even though it seems complicated, but it's, it actually demonstrates quite a few uh, points in a microservices architecture deployment. Okay, so why don't we just go see it? Uh, how many people here use Kubernetes before? Or heard about Kubernetes? Uh, oh, very few people. Okay, that's all right. So here we have in Kubernetes when we deploy something, uh, basically all the deployment are written in a declaration in a YAML file or a JSON file, depending on what you like. Uh, so in this case, I can write a very simple descriptor that actually deploys my application, my Hello World service, for example. All I need to say is how many instances I want, and also the, the image that I want to use, uh, which is here. Okay, so that's the image I'm actually using to deploy into a cluster of machines. And the cluster is actually uh, right now running on Google Cloud. This is running the managed Kubernetes service. You just click a button, you get you know nodes, you get VMs, and then um, and you have Kubernetes running on it already. And here I have five nodes. So you can see as I deploy this application, I have two instances of the Hello World UI, right? Because I need high availability, of course. And then I have a Zipkin running in the back end here, uh, just to store trace data, because this is a microservices application. I need to know uh, who's going what. And I have the guestbook service, I have you know MySQL deployed in here as well, and so on and so forth. Okay? Uh, now one thing that's very, very important is that um, every one of these boxes, these application instances, they also have something called labels. Labels are really, really important in Kubernetes. Uh, these, these are just key value pairs, so you can name it whatever you want. For example, you can say uh, environment is staging, and you can do that. You can say something like uh, conference is um, the uh, Vox state, right? Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's just key value pair that you can use later to help you query and ask Kubernetes, ask your cluster, what is actually running in my environment. Okay, so I can do a query that says, hey, give me everything that matches the label of app is equal to Hello World service. Then it'll give you all of these 
uh, application instances matching the description. Okay. So here I have a few other labels uh, visualized just so I can see in this particular visualizer. And then, as you can see, we also have load balancers in the front. Uh, that's because load balancing is a first class citizen in Kubernetes. So we have this Hello World UI. Let me see if I have it. Uh, yeah. Here we have the UI service. So to create a load balancer, all I have to do is to describe this uh, service in a YAML file as well. And if I scroll down, I can say, well, for this particular load balancer, uh, this load balancer is going to listen on port 80, right? And then it's going to target port 80 as well. Um, and then the way that the load balancer selects which backends to route the traffic to is by using labels. Okay, so just keep that very clear. So right now we have everything deployed already, right? To deploy everything, all I needed to do was to say kubectl apply all the YAML files into an environment, and this is what I get. So uh, this also provisioned a automatically a, uh, a load balancer in the cloud. Uh, and also, Kubernetes is agnostic to the actual cloud environment. So if you are on Google Cloud, it just provisions the Google Cloud load balancer for you. Okay. So for the first time, we can actually go see it. Did it load? Let me try this again. Yeah, okay. So we can see the little spring leaf here. So we know this is a spring application. So let's go see. Um, yeah, I know what you're thinking. Uh, as as the audience in a, in a live demo situation, you're probably always hoping to see a demo fail. <laughs> I guess this is your day today. Um, well, I guess uh, I guess that's it. I, 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 the refresh doesn't work, so that's too bad. Um, thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> Thank you. Well, well, let's try let's try to figure out what's happening here. Um, so, so we see this is some, it's probably the worst error page that you can ever see. Uh, why? Because you know it's an internal server error with status code 500, that makes sense. And then we see a 404 on the same page. And then we see a null. Um, and, and that explains everything. <laughs> this is a Java application, that's the, the least that we know, right? Um, so what do we do in this case? If somebody calls you at 2 a.m. in the morning and say, Hey, we have an issue in our production environment. Uh, if this is the situation, what do we end up doing? There are many, many things that we will go through in our mind to try to troubleshoot this and figure out the root cause, right? So, let's see, there, there are a few things that we'll I'll probably do, right? The first thing I ask is, well, is the staging environment working, right? Is it something that's only reproducible in staging? And, oh, so is it something that's only happening in production but not in staging, right? So that's something that we can possibly check. So in Kubernetes, uh, here in the production environment, let me see here, I'm really nervous now because things don't work. So if I say get pause, if I have internet, uh, there we go, I can see the existing application instances that's running, okay? Uh, in Kubernetes, we also have the concept of namespaces. What that means is in a single cluster, you can actually carve up your cluster, like. Uh, Five machines, ten thousand machines, five thousand machines, whatever. You can carve up this logical cluster into logical namespaces. So what I have done here is that I created a namespace called staging. And this is what a lot of people do. They may have a production cluster, but then they have a non-production cluster that has a namespace called staging, a namespace called dev. In fact, every team get, can get their own namespaces. Within the namespace, I can actually run exactly the same application. Um, with exactly the same load balancers, with exactly the same way to connect to everything. So in this staging namespace, I have everything running as well. And of course, I also have exposed the load balancer too, so I can go and check the namespace uh, staging here. So that's the IP address for staging. Let me see here, let me just make sure. If I open this up, this is the production environment, right, it doesn't work. And if I go to staging, oh, interesting. Okay, station works. So you can actually see what this application should have looked like. Hello, hello. I'm just saying hello and done. Yeah, so everything's working in staging. Good. Well, of course it works in staging, right? Like, why would I, why would I have promoted this uh, to production if it didn't work in staging, right? But it's still worth to check. Then we ask the questions of potentially, well, is the production environment actually the same 
as the staging environment, right? We need to make sure that's the case. So we can go and probably do a check to see are they actually running the same version of the app? Now, typically, the way that you check it is to see if what you actually deployed. So if I say UI deployment, remember, I, I send this up to Kubernetes, and Kubernetes deploy this based on the, the creations I have here. And it will deploy whatever image I set to deploy. And here, of course, I'm deploying something that was written by uh, Baruch. That's probably why it doesn't work. Um, just kidding. But, but I did make a very big mistake here. Check this out. This is using the latest version of the container. And this, by any means, is a very bad practice. Why? Because you may have pulled the latest version from two weeks ago, right? And I may have pulled the latest version from yesterday. Your latest may not be the same as my latest, right? So never actually do this because uh, this can be very misleading. So there's a high chance that my staging environment is actually not the same as my production environment because they put the latest tag maybe at different times, and so they're different. Okay, so we gotta be very careful here. Now I know somebody might say, well, this is continuous delivery, right? Always deploy the latest, but no, you should always tag your uh, images properly, okay? So how do you actually check then if they are not the same or if they are the same? Uh, one sure way to do this is by using the SHA. So every container image has a SHA ID uh, that is generated based on the, potentially the content of uh, this, uh, this image. So what we can do is to actually see the SHA ID. And the way we do it is by doing something called describe. So we can use Kubernetes to say describe the pod. So I can describe this particular instance that I have running in my production environment. And when I do this, I can see all the details of what I have configured for this particular application. Uh, not only can I see you know, where this is running, I can see the environmental variables that I set here, right? And this is trying to connect to the remote services, and that looks okay. Um, that is, in fact, a service I'm trying to connect to. Uh, if I scroll up a little bit here, I can actually see the image here that's latest. Never actually do that. But the sure way to understand if they're running the same image is by checking the shot, okay? So, so this shot is very, very long. I can only memorize up to four digits myself. So I need everyone's help here to help me remember. Uh, I'm gonna do the first four, uh, and then somebody can help me remember the last four, okay? So zero, three, four, seven. All right, you got it? You got it? All right. So I can go and say get, uh, let me check the namespace staging. Let me go get the pods, and then let me go do the describe again. So I can say describe pod, and I, I forgot the number already. All right. I see here. So if I scroll up here, um, there we go. Zero, three, four, seven. I think that's that's the first four digits. Yeah. Did anybody check the last four? Yeah. 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 Everything middle doesn't matter, right? That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the shot. It's probably pretty good, right? So, so I think it's the same. So then that makes it um, a little uh, difficult to kind of figure out. But but maybe maybe I can figure out well, uh, what did I actually deploy. Well, what I actually deploy is actually here in my examples, Java. And of course, I have this Hello World UI application, right? What do I actually deploy here? Um, and then I have the Docker file here. And, ooh, that's interesting. So, um, so here I'm installing a few things. I'm copying the library. And then I finally copy the app in there. And of course, the app is also a snapshot. So as much as you love uh, continuous delivery, just always version your stuff. And then this is actually deployed into app.jar, so we actually still don't know what version this is running. Now, given that's the case, uh, one of the things that we could potentially use is that given the shop, if you have stored this in a, uh, some kind of uh, image repository or Docker registry that allows you to search through the shop, you might be able to get more information. So in this case, I'm gonna come to Artifactory because this is stored in Baruch's Artifactory. And if I log in here, uh, I can actually go to the search, and then I can search by the checksum, and then I can just paste in the shop. And here I can actually figure out, okay, it is in fact uh, version 50, or the build number 50 of this app. 
Uh, and of course, we can drill in into this a little bit further. We can actually see, uh, for example, uh, how this Docker image was built. We can see the entry point and a few other things that was stored in the Docker file. But more importantly, if we go to the manifest, we can see who deployed this uh, mark. Okay, so that's interesting because uh, I just know Baruch. I actually don't know Mark, so I don't know who that is. But we can do even more, right? So if you have some kind of registry that allows you to keep track of your entire CI/CD pipeline and all the states and the info. Uh, in this case, we have the build uh, 50, and we can actually link to the CI/CD server. In this case, it will be Jenkins. And of course, Jenkins is down, uh, as it always happens, right? How many people here uh, have had this happen to them? Like they build something, and then a few like weeks later, they figure out, oh, Jenkins is gone. Anyone? Yeah, there's always some people in the room. But that's okay, uh, because um, in this particular case, when we do the build, uh, all of the metadata is actually published to, in this case, Artifactory. So we can actually see more. Uh, in particular, we can see the environment the variable that was associated with the build. Uh, for example, um, which Java we are using and all the configuration that we use for the build. And then we can see the actual modules that was being deployed, in this case, we can see a snapshot, but we know specifically which build of the snapshot. So that's all very interesting. But at this point, I think I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure they are running exactly the same app on both staging and production. And, um, hmm. and, and I think it is the right application because obviously it works in staging, right? So it's definitely working there. So there's definitely something wrong with the application. Then what do we do? Logs. Somebody said logs. That's right. So we can go check the logs. So there's a really easy way to see the logs in Kubernetes. If you know which instance you want to see the logs, rather than SSH into the machine, go find the right directory, and then find the right file name, and maybe the file got rotated out, and you got you got to unzip everything, the, the archive logs and all that. Well, rather than doing that in Kubernetes, you can do something like this. Uh, I don't need to get into the machine directly. I can just say kubectl log slash f, and then I can just give it the name of the instance I want to see. Press, if I press enter, I can see the logs. Now, I got a math question for everyone here. I got two instances here, okay? What are the odds for me to actually find this log on the first try? Anyone? It's one out of two, 50-50, right? So I got 50-50 chance to do it. But in a microservices environment, we don't always have just two instances, right? I mean, what if we have 10 instances running, and now the logs could be in any of the instances, couldn't it? So if I see get pods again, and then if I you know, do this refresh, right? Now I have 10 instances, they're gonna be running pretty soon. Then what are the odds for me to be able to find the log in one of these instances? Anyone? Yeah. Don't know? Yeah. Well, as my good friend Baruch would say, he would still say it's 50-50. <laughs> And then he will give you a good explanation. What he said is, well, you either find the log or you don't. So, so you have 50 50 chance of finding it, right? But let's say you do kind of think that you know which one to look at. All we need to do is to say QCTO logs dash F. And I'm going to give uh, that one, for example, right? And I can just tilt the log this way if my connection is working. Yeah, if it's, yeah, there we go. So I can actually, oh, oh, lucky day. I actually see the log. So I can scroll out this log, right, as, as the new um, messages are coming in. I can actually see this log. I can see, oh, this is a client exception. So there was a, a client call, potentially, uh, with a 404 null, and so on and so forth, which is not too bad. But I do have 10 instances here, right? Sometimes I don't really just want to go and try each and one of them, because that's, that's, that's just like SSH into individual machines. Uh, what we can do here is that there are a few really good utilities out there. One of them is called Kubetail, the other one is called Stern. What you can do then is to say, let me just do a Hello World UI, for example. So I can say Stern Hello World UI, that is the name of my app or of my deployment. And what this will do is to find all the running instances, right, and just stream the log at the same time. So now if any of the instances prints the log, I can just see it, I can see very clearly which instance this log came from. Okay. Super useful. Uh, however, however, 
if you have a production environment that gets a lot of requests and you are getting a lot of the logs, then this thing will keep on streaming forever, right? It will be very difficult to actually see what you actually want to see because you will just see like a matrix, like everything, like the letters dropping down the screen. It will be impossible for you to kind of stop and capture something. So this is where Kubernetes really shines because in a Kubernetes cluster, you can just install some kind of logging agent that can actually capture all of the logs here. Now the best practices when you run an application in Kubernetes is to store, is to print the log to STD out or STD error. What you never want to do in, in, in most cases is to write the log to file system. Okay, just try not to do that in most cases. Because especially if you wrote the log into the container file system, if you don't restart your container, uh, the log will accumulate for a very long time because there's nothing that helps you to clean it up. If you do write it to the file system, you, you gotta make sure it writes to the external volume, but typically that can be slower too. So it's just best practice to just output your log to SDDL and SDDL. And then there are many, many different agents out there that can listen to the, the SDDL streams and just you know re suck up all the logs and then propagate it to a centralized logger, okay? Which is what you actually want. Uh, because then you can go to a central central place to look at all of the logs, you can search, you can even filter by the time frame when this issue happens, and so on and so forth, right? If you're running Kubernetes on-premise, uh, most people will probably look into uh, the Elk stack, the Elasticsearch, log stash, Kibana uh, combination, uh, in which case you can just go to Elasticsearch, you can search a log from there, right? Uh, that's pretty straightforward, but if you're on the cloud, uh, sometimes we, you know, the cloud vendors will provide you some kind of services there too. So in particular, in our case, uh, because we're running on the cloud platform, uh, I can actually uh, go to the, the logging console, okay, so if I can find this. And this is just uh, out-of-the-box integration in this particular case, but just remember, uh, no matter whether you are running on-prem or if you're running the cloud, you got to install some kind of centralized logging, because then, what you can do is you can see uh, all the logs from all of the Kubernetes uh, uh, containers that you're running inside, okay? So in this particular case, what I can do is I can go into my uh, GK container, uh, I can go to my cluster, I can look at the different namespace that I have, so I wanna see the production logs, so I go to default, and then I can navigate into which application I wanna see the logs for, so I'm gonna go and find Hello World UI, and this will help me narrow it down, and then uh, and here we have the, the null pointer or whatever that was, right? And I can actually see this, this, this issue. So at this point, I, I can pretty, I, I'm a little bit more sure that this issue uh, may be happening on a client side somewhere, trying to connect to a server, but I still don't know why exactly this is happening, right? Because obviously it, it works in, uh, in staging, all right? But, but there are a few other things I will actually want to check in this case. Because I have to deal with uh, production issues uh, for a, a few years, actually, for a very large hospitality company. So this company uh, sells uh, their, their hotel chain. And what happens in the hotel industry is that uh, in the morning, in about 8 a.m. Uh, central time in the United States, that is when all the traffic is coming. Okay? So if something happens at 2 a.m. In the, in the morning, I need to res resolve everything by 8. So one of the first thing that I check is where is this log coming from, and this is if this log is limited to just one machine, or if it if it's coming from all of the machines, right? Because we all know if this issue is happening on just one machine, what do you do? Yeah, <laughs> you bounce it, you restart it, right? Maybe, maybe, but but we're not. We, we may or may not be able to do that. Okay, I'll tell you why. But how do we actually ask those questions? How do I actually get more information from the logs? In the past, this is what I do. I will SSH into every single machine. I will do SCP, I will download all the files. I will hopefully write a Perl script to go through all the logs and parse it and try to figure out timelines and group them. Or maybe if I'm lucky, I have a, a Hadoop cluster, maybe I put it into HBase and then I write a big um, script and to do analysis, right? Well, in some of the platforms, this is what you can do. Uh, 
uh, this is one of my favorite uh, thing actually. Uh, we can actually create potentially a, a, an output or a stream of this. So we can potentially analyze the log in near real time. If you push it to a centralized logger, you can actually listen to new logs coming in. But in this platform specifically, we can actually uh, export it to something called BigQuery. Now BigQuery is something that we use internally called Dremel. Uh, anyone heard about Dremel before? No? Yeah, a few people. That is how we actually query logs in some of the other structured data. Uh, if you've never seen it before, this is what you can do. Uh, imagine being able to write a SQL query with your logs. That's pretty cool, right? So, so in this first example, right, this is just querying something from the Wikipedia output. Uh, it's a very simple query with a with SQL-like query where we have a select statement and we have group by. If I run this query, what this will do in this particular example is that it's going to scan about two terabytes of data. Right? Imagine if you have two terabytes of log, this is what it can do. Now, how long do you think this process might take? Minutes? No? Seconds, that's right. So we are able to scan and query two terabytes of data in about 13 seconds, which is pretty awesome if you ask me. And there's no indices in this case. So we can actually use this very same system to query our logs. So for example, we can say something like, hey, tell me how many times this particular exception happened for this application uh, that is of the type container, right? And I can actually say uh, more definitively here for today. And I'm going to group by the name of the application. I'm going to, uh, and also by the name of the pod, and I'm going to count the occurrences. I'm going to sort it uh, by, by the occurrences as well. And we can actually see whether this is happening in just one instance or many, many instances. And here we can see that the errors are happening mostly in two of these instances, right? Then what do you do? It's 2 a.m. in the morning, you figure out two of the instances are bad, you, you restart it. <laughs> and you can if you want to, right? So in Kubernetes, what you can do is to just delete it. So you can say delete pod, and that's going to kill that instance and automatically restart another one for you, right? But, but I don't think that's the best uh, solution to everything, right? It, it's, not like, uh, it's not like the JVM where uh, how many people here restart your JVM every week? Yeah, some people do when you're running on a heap, right? But it's not like that because if you do kill this instance right now, what if the issue comes back a week later again? Uh, do you just kill it again? Yeah, and then maybe you put this in a cron job, so you kill it every week. <laughs> yeah, everyone's like, yeah, I do that. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. Uh, by the way, you can actually be putting a cron job in Kubernetes directly as well, but you shouldn't use it to kill your application every week, I'm just saying. What you can do, what you should do, is to somehow isolate this bad instance and ask questions, debug it, figure out what's wrong, because you cannot actually de de attach a real like, Java debugger to this instance right now because then you will stop the world. But what you can do is that you can uh, play with the labels. Now remember how we use labels to determine uh, which instances to run to in our uh, load balancer, right? So here I'm saying that my load balancer will only route traffic to app is equal to hello or UI. And the serving label is equal to true. That is something I added myself. This is my own label. So I can actually see uh, serving, for example. Okay, so if I see get pods, if I see serving, I can see that um, all of these application instances has the label of serving equal to true. What I can actually do is to modify this label at runtime and set it to false. As soon as you do that, then the low answer will no longer route request to that particular instance. Okay, so let me see if this instance is running up. It's right here, right? So what I can do is to uh, do a kubectl label. Uh, let me make this a little bigger. Okay, in the name of the instance, I'm going to just replace it with the name of the instance. Okay, overwrite the label and set the serving label to false. And that's it. As soon as, it, as, soon as uh, Kubernetes uh, catches up on this, give it a second. If I do a uh, get pause again, you will actually see that now I have this one instance that is serving uh, with the label of false, right? What that means is that this instance is now taking off of the serving path, but it's still running there. Now we can do interesting things. Uh, but before I go there, if you count the number of UIs, right? 
That is because, again, in my declaration in Kubernetes, I said I need to have 10 running instances at any given time. Well, I took one of them out of service, uh, it's going to realize, oh, I only have nine now, and so I need to uh, restart another one, right? Let me just make sure. Oh, well, that still doesn't work. Well, that's too bad. But you can see here very clearly that it started a new instance. But given that we have this instance isolated, what I can do is, for example, I can do something like exec. So I can just um, go into the shell of this application. Uh, we need to go that one. So I can say kubectl exec, just like Docker. Uh, but rather than SSH into the machines, I can just do kubectl exec, and I can go in and run bash. And now I should be inside of this container. I can see the application that's here, uh, that's running on PID ID 1. And I can do interesting things, like I can ask it for a stack trace, I can, uh, or thread, the thread dump and all that stuff. If you are familiar with the command line tools, like JSTAT and all that, you can just do whatever you want in this instance now. But what is more interesting is to see and test this instance directly. Then to do that, I need to open up a port, a connection directly to that instance. And I cannot do that with the load balancer because if I connect to the load balancer, I don't know which instance I'm going to get connected to. And more importantly, this application is taken out of service now. So what I can do is to actually establish what we call the pull forward. And this will actually establish a secure connection to the Kubernetes master node and then connect to that specific instance of the app. And I can map it to a local port on my local machine and I can forward the connection to the remote port of that particular instance. And this is super useful. You can get into the JMX port if you want to. You can get into the debugger port if you want to. In this case, I'm just going to see if this instance is actually running properly, right? Because from the log, we determine that this instance has the most issues. So we can actually go and see how this works. So I can go to localhost 9080, right, for example. And remember, this will establish your secure tunnel to my master and then forward the traffic to that particular instance. And of course, that seems to have worked, right? Hello, oh, that's interesting. So that works, but my application still doesn't work. Okay, so that, that is too bad. We're almost out of time. No, I'm just kidding. So we got, we got 20 more minutes. All right, let's see what else we do. So we check the logs, we check the staging environment, we check that they are running exactly the same app. This is a mystery, isn't it? But that is what happens when you have a microservices application, right? Because, right? because, because it is uh, potentially complicated. In this deployment, I am running many, many different things, right? And all the, these things are interconnected, right? And as you can see, when I scale this out, my visualizer also tells me that I have 10 instances now, right, which is great. But there are all of these connections that's happening. We may or may not know what is actually wrong with these connections, right? We're, we're pretty sure everything is exactly the same. It should work, but we don't know why it doesn't work. Then we have to go make assumptions. For example, okay, maybe Hello UI has a connection here to guestbook service. Maybe there's an issue there, because I don't know where it actually connected to. Maybe the guestbook service connects to MySQL. Maybe that's where the issue is. I don't know, right? And, or, and so on and so forth. Because we have all these interrelated services that's calling each other. Then we, maybe we need to go and see uh, maybe other services are actually having issues. And this is where observability becomes really, really important. I've seen customers or other uh, potential prospects in a community situation that are deploying uh, a lot of microservices but they never thought of distributed tracing up front, okay? Because that's what we need. Because if I look at this, this diagram right now, and I'm telling you in this diagram that Hello UI is in fact talking to a guestbook service. Do you believe it? Is it something that you can actually trust? Anyone? No. No? Why not? Why? <laughs> Any guesses of why? Well, I'll tell you why I don't trust this one either. Uh, because this is actually documentation, okay? I hard-coded these lines, all right? And when I say that I hard-coded it, it's because in my deployment, if I scroll down here, and if I see um, the annotation, I physically wrote there that this service is using the other service, okay? <laughs> so that is bad, why? I don't know about you, if this happened to you before, 
Um, you, you're troubleshooting some issues, and then you said, oh, here's the documentation, let me go read it, okay? And a few hours later, you still can't fix the issue, and then somebody tells me, oh, sorry, that documentation is outdated by, by two years. I said, oh, why didn't you tell me that, right? So documentation in this case, especially for microservices, uh, it's very, very hard to keep up to date. So you gotta be very careful there. What is the best solution to do that? Well, you need a real, almost real-time observability into what's happening in your cluster. And there are some tools to do that, but for, at the application level, what you need is distributed tracing, right? And just to put, to put in context, this distributed tracing concept is not new. Uh, basically, the idea is that when, when the request is being made, uh, somebody generates a unique ID. And this ID is propagated downstream to all of the services that you call, and then downstream to all of the other services that they call. And then if you do have written any logs against these, uh, these, this ID, you can actually get this ID and go back and see all the logs that's associated with this particular request, right? And this was not new because I remember uh, almost 10, more than 10 years ago, I don't know anyone here went through services-oriented architecture days, so a days, yeah, some people have. That is what we needed to do as well. We haven't learned their lessons after 10 years, right? But, but back then, the first thing that my manager told me to do was, Ray, we need to propagate this request ID uh, all the way down on every single call. And I said, why? Well, the reason is that if a particular service is having an issue, we need to know that's the case. If a service is running slow, we also need to know when that request started and when that request ended, which we need to know if that service is, which service is running slow, right? So in our case, we're using a Spring and Spring Boot, we're using Spring Cloud Smooth, we're propagating the data to Zipkin, for example. You can do that on frame, so make sure you have a distributed tracer, and then you're storing the trace data. Uh, what we have done is that we have a Zip, Zipkin proxy, so rather than storing uh, and seeing all the data within Zipkin, uh, we can actually see and browse the data in, in our console as well. In this case, this is a Stackdriver console. Uh, so what we can do potentially is to say, okay, I know I have a 500 error. Let me go see the HTTP status. And maybe it's a 5xx, so let me take a look at that. And here I can see a few traces, right? So I can see here, I can see that the, tr the, the code came in and it took about 54 milliseconds to complete. It made a call to hello, right? And so on and so forth. And finally, here's the 404 of hello, right? That explains a lot of things. You can, of course, see this in Zipkin as well. You can see this entire code stack. But now we're pretty sure, to some extent, that this issue is happening in the hello service, right? Now, without this type of tooling, it will become very, very difficult for anybody to debug the entire stack because it's just very, very complicated. But now we know that this is potentially happening in the follow service, uh, but we still don't know why this is being triggered, right? Of course, we can compare it with another trace that is actually okay. So for example, I have no trace that's okay, am I? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, every trace probably failed at this moment. So, so then what do I do? Well, in most situations, when you're really, really stuck, when you're really stuck, what happens? It is because we didn't have enough logs. The log was not useful, was it? It's a 404 null. If I go see the hello world service, I probably don't find anything there because the request is failed. Then we may need to go back and add more logs. How do you add more logs? If you have something running in production, okay, you will probably check out the revision that's in production. And then for that particular revision, you go back and you add the log messages. Okay? And then you go, you check it in, you go through all the testing. Why? Because log messages, I don't know why, but if somebody will say, well, let me test it if it's still working. And then you push it to, produ to, produ to production. Uh, and that cycle may be actually very long. Uh, could take like 30 minutes. Uh, how many people here can deploy production within 30 minutes? Oh, wow, nobody. <laughs> slow, I mean, faster than 30 minutes. I don't mean slower. Yeah, still no? Yeah, there's one person. Yeah, very good. But if you're not lucky, like Chris, I mean, uh, within one hour, you can deploy to production. Oh my goodness, yeah, okay. So like 5% of the room, right? So imagine you needed to add more logs and you gotta wait more than one hour to do it. And what if the issue doesn't happen again, right? And now that's too bad. And you still don't know what's happening. 
we can do better. This is probably the, the, the best thing that, um, that you can do. So, we, we went through all the debugging steps, right? We kind of determined the root cause is probably in the Hello World service, but we're not 100% sure, but we know it's probably there. But we need more logs to validate this theory. I need to see what's actually happening here, okay? Uh, what I have done right now is I added a debugging agent, a debugging agent, into my application for Java, okay? And that debugging agent is uh, communicating securely with Google Cloud in this particular case. Uh, what we can actually do with this debugging agent that we use in a production system is to be able to add logs to your systems in real time. So, how do we add logs? Well, I can see that I have different applications running. I want to add a log to the, the UI. And if I scroll down here, right, this is my controller, this is my screen application. Uh, and I'm going to just add a few logs. I'm going to say, um, this is how we debug as Java developers, or maybe JavaScript developers. One, I'm here, right? <laughs> I can do that, right? And I can add another log here. I can say two, uh, I'm here, and the name is, and so I can use a variable here as well, right? And then I can say um, three, I'm here now, right? This is how we debug, right? As soon as I added those lines, it's propagated to all of the running instances, all of the team instances I have. If I go back here and if I use stern, and if I see the uh, hello world UI, right? So I have all these logs. Okay. Now, remember, this agent just now propagated all of these log lines into my application. Uh, if I do a refresh, boom, right, I can see the logs, the, 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 uh, the exception, of course, but if I scroll up enough, let me see here, how many think this will actually work? Well, let me see. Well, where's that log? Ah, oh, there we go. Aha. Do you see it? Number one, I'm here. And number two, I'm here, and the name is missing. That's why it's a user error that the user forgot to put the name in there, right? And we can validate this even more, right? How do I know that this is in fact causing the error? Well, I can go to my, uh, potentially my Hello World service uh, here. So this is actually making the, the call with the REST template. I can just debug or uh, I can add this line as well, but we can do better. What we can do is to actually add a snapshot. How many people here would love to be able to debug your application live in production environment? Yeah, yeah a few. Uh, stopping the world? No, <laughs> no, I want to stop the world, right? But, but that's a very good job security because if you debug in production environment and you stop the world, some people will ask you, hey, what's going on? Why is the application not responding? And you can say, oh, let me fix it. So you just step through everything, right? It's going to happen again and again, and they will just always come to you and ask you to solve the problem. But in our case, um, we can actually add this, add this debugger, and we can actually take a snapshot as almost like a real debugging agent, okay? So I can take a snapshot here, and if I go to this page again and do a refresh, it will actually capture this snapshot, and I can actually see very clearly that the name is empty. I can also see very clearly the entire code stack as well. And this not just works within the console, it also works in IntelliJ as well. Like I can fire up IntelliJ, the IDE right now, I can attach this debugger into the system and everything will just work, right? And now we can very definitively say it's a user error because the user forgot to put in the name. And we can do even more. So for example, we can capture based on condition. So if we can check, like we can, if the name is empty or something, we can type this condition here so you don't capture uh, all, all, all sorts of different snapshots. Okay? So that is pretty awesome. Um, finally, who here actually check your error logs uh, when nothing, uh, when, when there's no bug? Okay, so for, for two weeks, right, nobody reported any bugs. Uh, how many people actually just go in every day to see your error logs? No, <laughs> some people do, that's a good idea, right? Why, why is it a good, good idea to just see? Because there may be new errors that you didn't know about that might actually build up over time and maybe somebody found a vulnerability in your application and boom, one day, they're going to hit that error really, really hard and then your entire system could have issues as well. Now remember about centralized logging, uh, always use a centralized logger, so uh, this can work uh, potentially in the ALP stack as well. 
So basically what we do is that because we have all the, the log messages, uh, these centralized loggers can also automatically identify new errors that you have maybe not seen before. In fact, we'll probably email you and tell you that, hey, there's a new error that we haven't seen in the past, so we can actually show that to you. If you've seen a new error, you can, of course, click into that, and we can see the distribution of how often this error occurred, we can see the logs, and we can, of course, jump into the logs. And one last thing I want to show before um, I take questions. Let me see, oh, it's not here. Uh, one of the, the, the last thing I want to show you is that if you have the log messages and the traces uh, sharing the same trace ID, uh, then what you can do is to potentially, oh, I mean, log in here. Ooh, I hope I don't show you anything that you're not supposed to see, so we will see, okay? So what we can actually do is we can go to trace, let me see here, where's the trace stuff? Uh, there it is, trace, yeah. So we can see the trace list. I got five minutes, I believe. And let me see the traces from the past week or so. Oh, there we go. So if you actually correlated everything between the traces and the log, so if the log actually has the trace ID, uh, what you will get is something like this, where you can say show logs, and you can see all the log messages that you associated with a particular request with that particular span, with that particular call. And if you have exceptions, you can see it here as well. So it's super, super useful, okay? So, with all that being said, let's see here, I have a few more slides. There we go, okay. Um, a few other things I just wanna note. Uh, if you do store the trace information in a, a, a centralized trace server, uh, some of the capability that you can implement yourself or that you can get with the service is to analyze the trace between uh, what the, the latency were from a week ago compared to now. Because maybe you deployed a new version of the application. You can actually use the trace data to compare and understand if the performance are similar or if you have a performance regression. Right? That's again very, very important for you to have the trace data stored. Um, if you need to, to have loggers, uh, being able to add logging messages directly to your application, uh, we actually, in this particular demo, we added a debugging agent. And this debugging agent is actually something we use internally at Google in our production system as well. So it doesn't have uh, much of the overhead that you see in other debugging agent uh, because we actually use this in production as well. And you can reduce this debugging agent in your own data center and in, in your own uh, environment as well, okay? Um, let's see, so just remember, to help you troubleshoot this particular issue, right? There are a lot of things I use to help me, the Kubernetes command lines, that's really, really useful. Stern or Kubetail to help you see the logs. Uh, as you see a centralized logger, always logs you the CD out. And most importantly, in my mind, is actually having that distributed tracing uh, system so you can get real information on um, what is actually happening within your microservices architecture, okay? And with that being said, uh, just remember, we do have some of the, the cloud services as well, but if you are not on the cloud, there are always the open source um, services that you can install too. And with that being said, uh, thank you very much for your time, and here's the link to my talk and the information, the source code, the video, the slide, and uh, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. What's that? What was the issue? Ah, that's a great question. The, the issue was, why was this failing? Um, let me see here, localhost static. So I will tell you the, the, the root cause of this issue. Well, the root cause of this issue is because the name is empty. So, but also because I stored the name in a session. So, <laughs> so to, so what happened is if I actually open up a new window, like a guest mode, uh, this actually works just fine. But as soon as you put a name that's empty, like here, and say hello, uh, remember, because the name was empty, that's what triggered the error. If I do that, you get this error message. So that is a little bug that I actually discovered before this talk, and uh, it happened to a product manager when he was actually presenting this, and I, did, I couldn't figure out what was wrong with my app, 
uh, until I actually went through the troubleshooting steps, some of them myself, to figure out, oh, of course, the name was empty, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> it, this true story actually happened to me. That's why I thought this, uh, this is um, hopefully valuable lessons to share as well. Okay. And you had a question as well? The same. The same was the issue? Okay, very cool. Any other questions? Yeah, one more. Maybe one more question. I have a question about uh, uh, the back mode. Uh, you put repoint. Uh, what about production users that call the service at the same time? Yeah, so you mean uh, when I took a snapshot or, or the logs, right? Yeah, if everyone is doing it at the same time, you go to uh, the first, if it's a debugging, sorry, if it's a debugging snapshot, the first user that hits that line will actually get a snapshot. They only get snapshotted once, okay? So it's actually pretty important that if you can narrow down the conditions uh, of what you are looking for, uh, you need to, for example, add a snapshot here, but also adding the condition of the snapshot. So if you know the request ID you're looking for, uh, if it's within the context, if it's something you can navigate to within the object tree, you can just say the condition will be request ID is equal to Blah, right? You can actually do that in this expression, so you narrow down the snapshot to only a certain user for a certain situation. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Cool. And I think that's all the time I have. Uh, but one more, last one, if you don't mind. Okay. Very cool. Thank you. Can can we use this tech drive outside of Google Cloud? Is yes. One parameter or other cloud platform. Yeah, so you can actually run um, all the things I showed you, um, utilize them uh, potentially outside of Google Cloud. So for example, for the debugger, uh, what you do need is to install the agent in your application. And also their credentials, so that, it, because you have to connect to some centralized server. So your app will be running on-prem, but the agent will, behind the scenes, connect to us. And that's how you can control the debugging uh, logs and, um, and snapshots. Uh, from the centralized server. Okay, so debugging agents you can run on frame, but to control it, you have to use uh, the, the cloud platform. So you need internet connection from your server. You need an internet connection from your on frame to the, the, the cloud, basically. Same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the overhead of this agent? The question is what is the overhead of this agent? Uh, it's fairly minimal. Uh, I don't have the actual percent, but it's so minimal that we run this in production environment ourselves. So it's not like 10, 20% overhead that's significant. It's so minimal that we actually do this uh, within, within all of our services that's running Java as well. Uh, they actually support Java, Python, Node, and a few other uh, languages. And Go, of course, okay? All right, cool, I think my time is really up. And if you have any questions, I'll be outside. And again, thank you very much for having me here. Cheers.